Good evening. Uh, turn with me to Genesis 3.1 if you're not there. We're going to, believe it or not, just read one verse. Uh, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Lord, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you that we can come and partake of your word together. Learn what you want us to learn. Be challenged in the way you want us to be challenged. I just ask for your anointing upon me, upon your word, that you will bring it forth as light and life. And that uh, whatever we need to see individually, Lord, that you would impart that to us individually. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together, still in a nation that's somewhat free, but, Lord, we know one day that might not be so. But, Lord, we have freedom in you to know you. I pray that you take everything that you've taught us by your Spirit and cause it to grow and become more sturdy in our lives. And we just thank you for everything, and we say this in your name. Amen. Uh, in chapter 2, we were given an insight into the reality that something was happening between Adam and God's relationship. Uh, the fact that he was alone shows that something was going on that was causing some kind of separation and causing him to stand distinct from creation. And when we get right down to it, the only reason that man feels alone is because his relationships are not good. You can put man anywhere you want. You can give him all kinds of things. We've seen it time and time again. But if his relationships are not right, that's when he feels alone. And God is after us as far as having a relationship with us. Because he knows that's how he made us. He made Adam to walk with him. To have that relationship. To have that interaction with him. And so when... Man stands alone is because his relationships are not right with God, first of all, and with others. And as he looks to other things, they don't fill him either, as we will see. Now, God's solution to this, his state was to give Adam a help meet, someone who would compliment him. But, you know, again, we ask in what way? And this is very important because as we consider the purpose of woman, she was to complement man, no doubt, physically as far as repopulation and all that stuff. I mean, we all agree. And to complement him is to have dominion as well, to maintain the environment. And so, but I also believe that she was there to spiritually complement him. Now, Adam stood alone because I believe he's getting away from God in his relationship. And if as, long, as you get away from God in your relationship, you become more and more incomplete in your life. Life becomes more dissatisfying. Life becomes more frustrating to you because you are becoming alone. And, uh, you know, man has a tendency to look to creation to fill those things in his life. And uh, no doubt... Adam was looking at creation. And what God showed Adam is that creation cannot complete you. Nothing in creation can complete you. So he took woman out, and no doubt man is to lead woman to, to God, but woman is to point man to God. She is to remind him what's important. Because the more we walk in this world, the more the world can take our eyes off of God, the more that responsibilities, especially men, more the responsibilities can take their eyes off of God. And so a woman was to point man back to God, remind man what is important. What's going to be a legacy in the end is that relationship you have with God and the relationship you have with others. Now we know that woman was separated from man, making him incomplete. But God instituted something called marriage relationship again to make man and woman one in a relationship. And once they become one, man's completed again. 
Now, man is not made complete again by creation, but he's not made complete by woman either. It comes down to relationship for a man to be completed. And isn't it amazing that we're such fleshly people who want to grab everything the world has for us, and we often miss the concept of relationship, and yet that's how people are completed. The marriage relationship where man and woman were made one, and this oneness in relationship pointed to the Godhead, their oneness in relationship, that they never stepped outside of each other's step. They never went contrary to each other. And that's how man and woman are supposed to function. They're supposed to be one in spirit. They're supposed to walk in agreement. They're supposed to make decisions together. And they're supposed to have the same focus, the same spirit, the same heart towards matters. The reason that there's conflict is because man and woman don't walk as one. They don't have the same goals. They don't have the same visions. They don't have the same purpose. Of course, the marriage relationship also pointing to Christ and the church. And this is probably the most important part of it. This is a precious picture which serves as a relationship. It's the first real example we have. The first real example we have is of marriage, pointing to Christ and his church. Now, that's incredible that he sanctified us. He sanctified marriage in such a way that it was the first example to man what God intended for a man to be complete in his life here. But that completion was more than just being in creation, having dominion, having that stuff around him. It was about being one in relationship, beginning with God, then woman. The world has tried to mar this precious picture, and we know that. It's declared it obsolete, it's declared it abnormal, silly, old-fashioned, etc. But you know what? Marriage is not a legal issue. It's not up for debate. It's a moral obligation. And the world is trying to take it out of the morality of it all and make it a legal issue, make it an issue of rights. No, it's not. God established marriage between one woman and one man for this very reason, because of what it represented. And man has tried to mar that picture of Christ and his church. And anybody out there saying, oh, well, that's who I am. No, that's not who you are. That's a lie from the world. We're going to talk about that lie today. The world insists on exploiting marriage in every way, but has God changed his mind? No, he has not. It doesn't matter about the debate. It doesn't matter about the legality. It doesn't matter about rights. God has not changed his mind, and he will not. Now, we have to understand what happened in chapter 3 between God and Adam because it will manifest itself in chapter, I mean chapter 2, if I said chapter 2, between God and Adam because it's going to manifest itself in chapter 3 with willful disobedience. Now, in, the, in this verse, in chapter 3, at verse 1, we see... The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He was more subtle. What does subtle mean? Well, subtle means cunning and crafty. So let's put this in perspective because it's important you understand this. Because when we come to this place, we debate everything but what's important. Okay, so let's look at Ephesians 4.14. 4.14, Ephesians 4.14. Because this gives us an important picture of how something subtle or crafty works. And we need to look at it from that perspective and have this foundation. 4.14. This is what it says. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. In other words, subtle. Whereby they what? Lie in wait to be deceived. That's where I got this title. Lie in wait. 
We're going to look at that a little bit because that is constantly looked over. Now, if you look at this, it tells us a couple of things about subtlety or about cunning and craftiness. And we're going to uh, consider how it works because it's a good description. First of all, you have to realize if someone is going to be subtle, the reason they're going to be subtle is to deceive you. You never have to be subtle about truth. You only have to be subtle if you're covering up something, mainly deception. So the first thing you have here is the motive of deceiving. That's where subtle comes into. So when we hear about the serpent, we know up front this serpent is what? Prone to deceive. It's subtle. Now, the next thing that you have to realize, if you're not based on truth and you're not established on the rock of truth, you're going to be tossed to and fro, easily carried away by heresies, religious fads, and fleshly and silly sentiment. And that's what we see with a lot of Christians today. Because they are not founded on the rock of truth. Now, those who use this craft and I, it's important to understand it's a craft. It's something that they devise. It's something they develop. Those who use this craft must slight you. In other words, they must defraud you. What does that mean? That means they're trying to set you up to betray what you know is right and true. That's what they're trying to do. When someone defrauds you, it's they want you to throw out your moral responsibility. They want you to throw out what's right and defraud yourself. Okay? And so when you hear the slight of men, it's because they're trying to defraud you. So the next thing we know is that this serpent, it wants to defraud. It wants to set up whoever it is to betray what they already know is right or true. Because if you stick to what you know is right and true, you're not going to away from that, are you? You have to be defrauded. You have to be set up. Now, cunning craftiness points to the fact that whatever means is used to deceive becomes a device or a craft. It becomes an actual craft, something that they develop. Something that they do well. Look at what 2 Corinthians 2.11 says. Second Corinthians 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his what? His devices. Craft involves some kind of devices that are used. Saints' greatest devices, we'll get down to it, is deception. Now, I want you to understand how this all works. Because this is, you know, we argue about so much, I'm going to bring this up. But what we have is a powerful example how deception works. How people are tempted and drawn away by deception. Now, we argue about all these points, but it's right there in the first verse of chapter 3. And we need to pay attention to it instead of just, all right, what we're going on to is our parents' failure. My concern, our first parents' failure, my concern is not what they did wrong. It's how they got there in the first place. How did they get to search such a state that they were deceived or were tempted in such a way they willfully disobeyed God? How did they get there? You know what, what the problem is today? The churches aren't talking about it. And you know what's happening? People are being set up and they're falling, falling constantly because they don't understand how all this works. If you don't really come to terms with how Satan used this serpent, how are you going to recognize it if Satan is trying to do the same thing to you? You can't. So I want to explain to you what started. As we go back to Adam, the first thing that started was a disruption 
in relationship. Disruption in relationship. You'll see this all the time. Next comes what? What follows is vulnerability. Once you have a disruption in what? Relationship, then comes vulnerability. If there's vulnerability, you know what follows that? Temptation. Now, this is what Satan's after. If you fall in the temptation, then it's disruption of fellowship. And that's what he's after, is your fellowship with God. He wants to disrupt it. He wants to bring a separation between you and God, your fellowship. And it starts with disruption in your relationship with God. You have to discern that disruption. You have to discern it up front because this is the pattern that Satan will use in you, use against you. Now, to cleverly deceive someone depends, and this is important, this is the next part, it depends on timing. That's why the enemy lies in wait. It's all about timing. People are not deceived when they're at the height of everything. They're deceived when they're vulnerable. And you know what makes people more vulnerable? They don't know there's a disruption in their relationship with God. They don't know it. Now, the serpent provided the right environment in which the father of lies, the seducer of souls, could work. Who is the father of lies? We know that answer, but let's look at John 8, 44. 8, 44. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. He says, you are of your father, the devil. You talk about a tough statement. And the loss of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he's a liar and the father of it. There you go. He's a father of all lies. Now, now, the serpent presented the perfect environment for him to seduce, to deceive. And that's what's very important. What kind of instrument could Satan use on you? You say, oh, but, you know, that won't bother me. We're going to talk about how things can change quickly, okay? Because we can see it in this example now, I want to make a statement here. Again, I have stated this. How could an enemy of God be in the garden unless Adam allowed it? He had dominion. He had dominion, which shows us another problem. Because once there's a disruption in your relationship with God, and then this vulnerability happens, you usually... What becomes a manifestation of spiritual vulnerability is complacency towards God. That's what comes out is complacency. Why did Adam allow this, the enemy of God in? Because he was complacent towards God. A lot of times in our complacency, it's not that we are really turned off to God, but we are not concerned we figure we can handle it. How many of you said that? I've handled it. How well have you done it, right? Uh, I can take care of this. I can expose myself to this wicked thing. It's not going to disturb me. It's not going to harm me. Oh, well, just let the enemy of God in. I can handle it. 
whether it's through TV or through other means. I'm going to tell you, you can't handle it. You know why? Satan's bigger than you. That's why you can't handle it, and I'm going to show you how it works. Just how big is he? Okay, now this is another important point. When you are complacent, that's when Satan moves forward to take territory. Now, Satan is not the type to come on a frontal attack against you. What Satan does to take territory out, to take ter territories, he seduces people into giving it to him. Satan seduces people in giving to him the territory. That's what he does. Think about that for a minute. He's not going to take the territory away from you. He's going to seduce you into giving it up. He's very clever that way. That's part of his craft. Do not underestimate his ability. Was Adam properly keeping the garden, ensuring the spiritual integrity of it? No, he was complacent. He was complacent. He did protect his relationship with God. That is the thing we should value the most and protect the most, but do we? Now, most Christians... <clears throat> Lose their spiritual edge, please hear me, through neglect. They neglect their relationship with God. That's how they lose their spiritual edge. It has to do with complacency. It happens through neglect. When you're complacent about something, do you take care of it? When you're lazy about something, do you take care of it? No. We lose things through neglect. Many times. Hence enters this warning in Hebrews 2.3. Those who have been studying Hebrews will probably think, okay, I think I know the scripture. Hebrews 2.3. Let's look at it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? We end up neglecting what we have with God. We fail to keep our edge. Now we can see that the breakdown in Adam's relationship with God was clearly going to manifest itself in chapter 3 because we can see it regressing, regressing, regressing from walking with God, from fellowship with God to this complacency towards God and his relationship. Now this brings us to another point, point. Cleverness never plays its hand outright either. That's why it's so clever. It's shrewd. It must wait for the right time and the right place. Did you hear my word? The right place to tempt. You have to be at the right place to tempt somebody. And you have to have the right time. The idea of the devil lying in wait is a tactic of enemies that can be seen throughout Scripture. You can read about it in the Old Testament constantly, how they, they laid there and waited before they attacked. That is how it works. What is the enemy waiting for? He's waiting for that which is vulnerable. He's waiting for that which is vulnerable. So let me ask you a question. Out of, between Adam and Eve, who would be the most vulnerable? Eve, right? Woman. Why? Because Adam had more of a history with God than woman did. 
How do I know that? Because up here in uh, chapter uh, 2, who gave who what? God gave Adam a command. That was before the woman was even on the scene. Adam had a history with God. God spoke to Adam directly about what was acceptable and what, what was not. So who would be the most vulnerable, the one who had the less history with God? I want to ask you something. How much of a history do you have with God? I'm not talking about just, you know, well, I've been a Christian for how many years. How much of a history do you have that shows you have been maturing and maturing in God? That's the beauty of history. How much have you experienced, walk, and know God? That's your history. And the more history you have, if you really love God, the less Satan will be able to trip you up because you know the history. You have the history. So woman was the one that was the weak Weaker of the two. Now you need to recognize the enemy knows your weak points and he knows how to wait for the right opportunity to set you up to fall into some type of temptation. He knows that. He knows your weak spots. But do you know? Do you know them? You've got to recognize them. Now, it's important for you and I to understand how this enemy works. We skim over these facts, don't we? Oh, well, that's nice, the serpent's in there. He's more clever. But, and we rush to criticize the fall of, of uh, the woman and the man. But we need to understand how Adam and woman found themselves in this place of grave temptation in the first place. That's why it's important to follow the pattern of Adam's relationship with God. How the garden got to this point. The environment change. And the, and the, important, and the important part was not a relationship with God any longer. Or he would have protected. Now we see what happens when there's this breakdown in relationship. It does end in complacency towards God as well as vulnerability. Because what we have to realize is failure to do right also means one no longer has the authority to stand. They don't have the authority to stand. Righteousness is what gives us authority. In other words, right standing, doing right, being right towards the Lord. The Bible says if you know to do right, you don't, it's sin. So we see because of what Adam failed to do, keeping the enemy out, he was already in a type of sin. There was already this breakdown going on in his relationship and in the garden. When you do what's right before God, it gives you the authority to stand on the rock with complete assurance that victory is near. Now this, import, this brings us to another important point. Where the serpent was lying in wait. You know where he's lying at, at, at wait? In wait? At the source of temptation. He was waiting at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I want you to think about that for a minute. If Eve wasn't in the territory, would he have been able to tempt her? He tempts you at the source of temptation. There's no power to tempt you anyplace else. So what would uh, be considered your source of temptation? Why do you need to know that? Because you need to avoid it or flee it when you find yourself accidentally in that situation. You've got to recognize it. It's important to realize that the Lord gives us a way out of temptation. How do I know that? 
1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells me. Now, a lot of times people use this in relationship to adversity, but people, it is strictly in relationship to temptation. It tells us that, not at adversity. I remember one time a man telling me, you know, that's not about adversity, it's about temptation. I said, you're right. But most of the time when we quote it, it's not in light of temptation. It's in light of adversity. There's a big difference. So let's look at what it says. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no what? Temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation. What? Also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it or withstand it. Okay? That's what it says. There is no temptation too great that can overtake you. That is, if you are tight with God. He's going to show you the way out. Usually the way out is flee it. Sometimes if you come up against Satan, it's quote the word of God. Humble yourself before God, quote the word, and he has to flee. But we need to recognize all this. We need to recognize any place of temptation, whether we accidentally walk into it or not. We need to recognize it. But as you see, this is where people get in trouble. People make a grave error, and this is what woman did, at the place of temptation. You know what she did? She tried to reason with the serpent. She tried to reason with him. She tried to reason with the serpent about what was true. My question is, why reason with the devil? He has no intention of being led to truth. His reason for being there is to lead you to deception. And what bait does he use? He uses half-truths a lot of times. Or he uses questions. And we're going to see how that all works. There's three ways that Satan can entangle us. And it's all because women begin to what? Reason with him. You know when we try to reason with Satan in our mind when it turns into logic than justification. Logic than justification. How does Satan reason with us? At a point of our logic. That's what he's going to do with this woman, as we're going to see next week. And then as the logic comes, we're going to see how deception works. To change that into justification of doing it. It's all here in the Garden of Eden, right there, for us to observe and get a hold of. Now, the devil has no intention of being reasoned with. He is there to entice you, seduce you, and cause you to fall into a false reality. That's why he's there. He's not there to uh, play some little uh, game with woman. He's there to deceive her. Okay, now consider this for a moment. I'm going to show you how this works. How many times do you think that this woman and Adam walked by this tree? Now consider this for a minute. All the trees in the Garden of Eden were what? Beautiful. Was this tree any more beautiful than the rest of the trees? I don't believe so. Because if it was... Wouldn't they have been attracted to it a long time before that? When something stands alone, that's what you notice about it. But there's no indication that they sought this tree out, that they noticed it. She was just wa walking by it. Think about that for a minute. It probably seemed like the rest of the trees, except it held the fruits of death. You say, well, why are you bringing this up? Because I'm going to tell you how powerful seduction is. This is what people don't understand about seduction, okay? 
Now, would she have even considered this tree unless she was first addressed? Here she's walking by the tree. What do you think that serpent did? Hey, hey. He called. He addressed her. Would she have stopped at that tree if he hadn't addressed her? It was the only tree that could change the dynamics of man's soul. His destination was that tree. And here's the serpent by this tree. And he addresses her. Now, I want you to understand the cleverness of seduction is that it will magnify something typical to make it look more beautiful, more desirable, and more worthwhile. That's the power of seduction. You may say, that's not important to me. But let's say that there's this weakness in your life, and it's a way that weakness can be used to tempt you to, and it's going to magnify whatever, and it's going to make it important, desirable, and worthwhile to you. That's how seduction works. Now, why do I say this? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11.3. Don't take my words for it. We're going to look at scripture. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Whoops. Yeah, in the wrong one. You got first Corinthians. I thought that's not the right one. Here. Second Corinthians. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians eleven three. So it says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent knows the word beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted. Notice the mind is corrupted through seduction from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, you know what beguiled is? is a very important word. If you don't understand it, you're not going to uh, really uh, comprehend what Paul is saying. Beguile means to be seduced wholly. Not just in a light manner, but completely seduced. That's what Eve was in the garden. She was completely wholly seduced by the serpent. The more she fell into his seduction, the more the tree was magnified in her eyes. Because what seduction does is it changes the reality of something. And it makes it all consuming that you have to have it, that you have to taste it, you have to experience it. That's what it's all about. In actual seduction, everything seems clear. But once you step away from that false reality, everything becomes confusing. Because it doesn't make sense. But in the actual seduction, it is like so clear. And it makes so much sense. And it just creates this euphoria in your whole sensation and in your whole everything. I mean, it's major. In fact, if you may intellectually know something when you're being seduced, it's not quite right, but seduction is basically taking your senses captive is what it's doing. So you can't discern what's wrong, and then it entangles your affections so that it's, oh, your lust begins to, oh, I have to have it type of thing. And in the end, you don't know which way you are. You don't know if you're up or down. Seduction is that powerful. Seduction is that powerful. It's demonic. That's why it's that powerful. Paul is clear that the woman was totally seduced, wholly seduced by the serpent by the time it was over with. Now, today there are many people 
and the world being seduced by the subtle means of education, religion, entertainment, etc. They are totally being consumed by the lie. They're totally being deceived. And their intellect has almost been nullified so they can't see exactly. Their discernment is all gone. And their factions are all caught up with it. And they are totally seduced. And they don't know it. Look at what 1 Timothy 4.1 says. First Timothy 4 1. This is a powerful scripture that Paul is saying here, and probably now that you have a better understanding of this, you can appreciate what he's saying. He said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days, times I should say, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So in the end days, there's going to be a lot of seducing demons, seducing people wholly, completely into the lies of the age. And we are seeing it. We are seeing that being fulfilled today, not only in the world in general, but in our own family, we're seeing that. Depending on who's influencing who. Boy, do we need the love for the truth, don't we? To stand on the truth. You know, I get irritated because for the most part, it seems like preachers have become a bunch of pansies when it comes to sin and these issues. They're pansies. They won't deal with it. Of course, a pansy is a strong flower, but in reality, our terminology is that they're weak. And dealing with sin and dealing with the issues that can take people captive, they're not teaching them, they're not warning people of how it all works. And then they wonder why there's no victory out there. We get caught up with debates after debates about who the blame, of who the blame, Adam, Eve, whatever. But you know what? That's a smoke screen. None of that has to do with anything. What is it covering up? It's covering up how people can be deceived, how people can fall into temptation. That's what it's all covering up. We're not dealing with the right subject here. We're missing the examples that God has given us. He has given us so much insight about temptation, about seduction, and how it works, and what are we debating about. I always ask the Lord, First of all, I know my weaknesses, and I always say, Lord, keep those things away from me that's going to tempt me, because I know my weaknesses. I know my place of temptation. I stay away from it. I stay away. I don't go there. The Lord has shown me those things, and we need to be serious about knowing them ourselves. What makes, where is my vulnerability? Lord, cover that with your armor. Cover that with your truth. We really need to challenge ourselves today and say, you know what, we have this example in the Bible and you know what, I need to recognize my serpent. I need to recognize my temptation. I need to recognize that place of temptation. I need to be sharp. I need to value my relationship with God. I need to test it out and make sure there isn't a disruption in my relationship that ends in disruption in my fellowship. 
as a as we come into that place of worship just uh, ask the lord to just come down in a powerful way and show you what he wants you to understand sometimes we're blindsided or broadsided by our weaknesses but god wants to show us and he wants to fill that with his power and his authority